This is the only city in America with an entrance. When you drive in from the airport, you do not see downtown as you approach. You see hills and valleys and the minutia of suburbia, but no city. Suddenly, the expressway dives into a tunnel through Mount Washington, and on the other side, revealed all at once, dramatically, is a skyline of striking power. This is Pittsburgh, the city of bridges. Nestled in the rugged terrain of Allegheny County, Pittsburgh lies at the confluence of the Monongahela and Allegheny Rivers, giving birth to the mighty Ohio, the main waterway that connected America's original 13 colonies to its western frontier. The first bridges here were wooden, but after many were lost in a massive fire in 1845, builders turned to steel. The main component of steel, iron, as well as bituminous coal, were mined extensively in this region, which is one of the most historically valuable mineral deposits in history. Barges full of these raw materials floated down from mining towns on a vast system of rivers, creeks, and streams to dock at the city's riverside furnaces, where it was smelted into rails, or beams, or sheets, and then barged onto the rest of the country and even onto Europe, especially during the two world wars. America's interstate highway system, built in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, was another boon, as much of the metal for its more than 50,000 bridges was produced in Pittsburgh. As the demand for steel soared, so did the need for bridges within the city itself, to carry the weight of industry and connect its burgeoning neighborhoods across deep ravines and waterways. Engineers pushed the boundaries of design here, creating cantilever, arch, and suspension structures like the Iconic Sisters, the only set of three identical bridges in the world, named after local heroes, the ball player Roberto Clemente, artist Andy Warhol, and conservationist Rachel Carson. Another innovative crossing is the longest traffic-carrying lenticular truss span in the world. Today, a total of 446 bridges exist in the city of Pittsburgh. But completely conquering its steep hillsides and mountains required digging an impressive series of tunnels. The most ambitious were the Liberty Tubes, the longest automobile tunnels in the world when they opened. All of this infrastructure set the stage for Pittsburgh's golden age, when it became America's eighth largest metropolis, with more millionaires than New York and more stockholders per capita than anywhere else. Large businesses were headquartered here, including the behemoth U.S. Steel, which at the time was the world's largest corporation and the first ever to be worth a billion dollars. At its peak, two dozen large steel mills across the Pittsburgh region were churning out half of all the steel produced nationwide. But it was risky being a one-industry town. And when the American steel industry began its decline as a result of international pressure and a series of economic recessions in the 1970s, it triggered a domino effect of mill and factory closures. More than 200,000 industrial workers lost their jobs here over a 20-year period to the mid-1990s, causing the city of Pittsburgh's population to plummet from a peak of 676,000 to around 300,000, where it's now stabilized. This much smaller tax base creates challenges in maintaining infrastructure that was built for a population twice as large. If something is allowed to deteriorate too much, catastrophe can strike, like the 2022 collapse of the city's Fern Hollow Bridge. Luckily, amazingly, no one died. In its incident report after the fact, the National Transportation Safety Board said inspectors repeatedly reported unmaintained blocked drains were causing water and road salt to accumulate on and corrode key points of the structure, which should have been closed to traffic. Sustainability policy expert Rebecca Kiernan took me to Frick Park where the bridge collapsed and helped put the incident into context. Really, we're just seeing a lot more extremes. So extreme temperature, you know, we have a warming and wetting trend, but um, it's a lot of extreme temperature swings. That wreaks havoc on our hillsides, on our infrastructure, you know, that freeze thaw cycle really breaks it up. And then when it gets hit with a big rain event or, you know, extra salting on the roads, that leads to landslides, corrosion, a lot of those challenges with our aging infrastructure and our unmanaged hillsides. 
Like many functions of government, staying on top of maintenance often comes down to competence. Allegheny County, which surrounds and includes the city of Pittsburgh and has a population four times as large, has proven it can be done. I sat down with its recently term-limited county executive, Rich Fitzgerald, before he left office at the end of 2023. When this region was really booming a hundred years ago or more when the Industrial Revolution was coming about and we had a population in, in Allegheny County of about 1.6 million, I think at our peak, we're at about 1.25 now. You have less people, less taxpayers, less you know, revenue coming in, but the bridges don't go away, the roads don't, I mean the, the, the actual physical infrastructure is still there. We own 400 miles of county roads and over 500 bridges, 312 I think of which are over eight foot long that we're responsible for, for taking care of. 72 of those bridges were rated in poor condition by civil engineering standards. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go over the bridge, it's going to ready to fall down, but they may have weight limit restrictions, they may have other restrictions that come into play and you know within a certain period of time you better get to it. But they all need work. They all need maintenance, they all need care, because if that's your bridge to be able to get home or get to work, it matters. To abandon a bridge or abandon a road or not fix it is not easy to do. So uh, certainly we've had population shifts, but that doesn't mean neighborhoods have zero people living in them. They may have less people living in them, but they still need to get from point A to point B. There's beautiful geography here in Western Pennsylvania, but it's expensive to get across. It's something that we as a society and as government have to invest in. So we put a plan together with our engineering and public works departments to catch up on this, where we just chipped away at it year after year after year. And by the end of next year, we're gonna be down to single digits, maybe four or five of those 72 bridges will be rated in poor condition. And they're all in the pipeline. And quite frankly, our workers work hard and they have a lot to be proud of. But we were doing a lot of this work even before that big infrastructure bill came about. That big bill is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act passed in 2021 with the support of all nine of Pennsylvania's Democratic House members, but just one of its nine Republicans. Yeah, we see a lot of wear and tear on uh, America's roads and bridges. It's why this infrastructure funding has been so urgently needed for decades. This wasn't just going to happen on its own. Uh, look, the, the infrastructure bill wasn't something that was automatically going to get done. The Biden administration has already awarded $8 billion to Pennsylvania for bridge repairs across the state, including $132 million to fix three of Pittsburgh's busiest crossings, the McKees Rocks Bridge, the West End Bridge, and the Fort Duquesne Bridge. We see a lot more construction projects than, than I've ever remember seeing in, in, in my years in government. Uh, and you've got a state government that's the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation and the infrastructure that they invest in. And then you've got counties, and then you've got all the municipalities, all these individual boroughs and townships and cities that also are responsible for things. And we all need to kind of work together because you know, most people, when they start driving to go to work, they might drive across five or six different municipalities a couple different counties, and maybe even come from another state. We've got people come from Ohio and West Virginia. This whole of government approach has helped the region turn things around after suffering population losses that most other Rust Belt cities are still struggling mightily to overcome. For 60 years, we lost population. The last time Allegheny County grew in population when the census came out was the 50s. So every decade until the 2020 census, that was the first time that we had grown population. And what's exciting is we're actually growing young population. Our 25 to 34 year old age range grew by 20% over the last decade, almost double the national average, which grew by 11%. Allegheny County's rich mineral resources are also a big part of this comeback. Quite frankly, having Marcellus Shale, uh, the largest natural gas find underneath our feet, that we discovered about 15 or so years ago had also infused a lot of wealth into the, into the community. More resources help, but it's the choices to invest public money in education and livability that are yielding some of the biggest dividends. The University of Pittsburgh and its leading medical school is located in the neighborhood of Oakland, right next to the 450-acre Shenley Park. Its world-class botanical garden, Phipps Conservatory, is home to the Center for Sustainable Landscapes the first and only building 
to meet seven of the highest green certifications. And it's still the most sustainable office building in the world, even though it just celebrated its 10th anniversary. Adjacent to that may be Pittsburgh's most important asset going forward, Carnegie Mellon University, consistently ranked number one in engineering, robotics, and computer science. The great thing about those two universities is they work together. CMU's typically more on the robotics, AI, software. Pitt is more into the medical technology, the biotechnology, the life sciences. Companies that are here work with both universities. It's kind of a secret sauce we've used, utilized here in, in, in this region. The city now hosts major players in the emerging autonomous vehicle sector, including Aurora, which just debuted its new driverless trucking product on a route between Houston and Dallas. It's headquartered in a formerly industrial part of town, now known as Robotics Row, for the large number of mechanical engineering-focused companies based there. We really are intentional about keeping that research and commercializing it right here to create jobs. That's why these big companies, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Microsofts, they're here because of the tech infrastructure and ecosystem that's really been created over the last couple of decades. Another attractive feature is the area's parks and bike trails, like the Great Allegheny Passage that eventually connects with the CNO Canal Trail in Maryland along the Potomac and can take you all the way into Washington, D.C. I've done it four times. It's a wonderful ride. It goes from the point at Point State Park, 335 miles along rivers all the way to Washington, D.C. We've invested an awful lot in our parks and our trail system. That's one thing I'm very proud of over the last 12 years, and it's noticeable. People come up to me all the time, and we intentionally had a goal of planting at least a thousand trees a year, and we have done that. It improves air quality, holds back rainwater. The county has seen an 80% drop in air pollution during Fitzgerald's time in office. He's pushed the county to purchase electric transit buses, dramatically increase recycling rates, install 10,000 solar panels to make Pittsburgh International the first airport with a microgrid, and leverage the natural power contained in the flow of the rivers themselves. We used those rivers for industry for many years. Well, now we're going to use them to provide power. So at one of our locks and dams, as the water goes over that, that lock and dam, it's going to turn a turbine. It's going to generate electricity for our lights and for our buildings, whether it's the jail, whether it's our nursing homes, whether it's our county office building, the courthouse, all the various things that we operate. Net Zero Parks, two of our nine county parks, now produce actually more energy because of the solar panels or the wind stacks that they have than actually taking power off the grid. When I told him how I was surprised to see people swimming in the rivers, Fitzgerald told me about how dozens of municipalities came together to tackle the stormwater runoff problem that was plaguing the rivers, which are the area's main source of drinking water. And it's working. They're now considered safe for swimming. We want to see people using the rivers again for, for recreation, for swimming, for fishing, boating, etc. And you can see it up and down our rivers. Real estate that was pretty much used for industry, used for factories, is often being reclaimed and residential development, commercial development, mixed-use development. But it only happens if the water and the air and the trails are in uh, environmentally good condition. As a mechanical engineer by training, Fitzgerald prioritizes making data-driven decisions. When I first came into office, a lot of things we would do, whether it be our health department, whether it be our human service department, we would give resources to probably people that had political connections or, or, or screamed the loudest. Well, we wanted to come to an area where we made data-driven decisions. Where should we pave the roads? Where should we run the bus line? Where should we you know, put our human service dollars? And we created a, a, a data center to try to take the politics out of who gets the bus service because they yell the loudest or is it the best use for the community? You know, it, it, it seems to have worked. Allegheny County and Pittsburgh are now considered models for entire governments and regions to follow. They're reminders that at every level of government, success comes down to well-informed citizens choosing honest problem solvers to decide what the most efficient investments in public money are. What are the assets, industries, processes that will lead to the best future for everyone. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, check out my series on Chicago, which I visited on this same reporting trip. Next, I'm profiling from afar how Bangalore, the largest city in southern India, 
is running up against the competing priorities of the national government to the north in Delhi.